How responsive is quantity demand or quantity supplied to a change in price? In other words, how much does quantity change if price changes? The answer depends on the good or service we are considering and how elastic the demand or supply of that good or service is. Elasticity refers to the responsiveness of something. We use similar terminology with rubber bands. When we discuss how elastic a rubber band is in response to a force applied to cause it to stretch. In economics, this analogy helps us understand how the quantity stretches or responds to the force of changing price. The price elasticity of demand is calculated as the percentage change in quantity is divided by the percentage change in price. Let's first look at the elasticity between point A and point B. First we calculate the percentage change in quantity. Note that we average the denominator before we divide. Then we convert it to a percentage by multiplying by 100. Our percentage change in quantity is 6.9%. Next we calculate the percentage change in price. Note that we divide the denominator by 2 to average it, and then we multiply it by 100 to convert it to a percentage. Our percentage change in price is negative 15.4. Finally, we calculate the price elasticity of demand coefficient. Coefficient is a word used to denote a number that helps us measure a property. In this case, the property we are trying to measure is elasticity. We divide our percentage change in quantity by our percentage change in price, and that gives us a price elasticity of demand coefficient of negative 0.45. But note that for price elasticity, we take the absolute value of the coefficient and drop the negative sign. So our price elasticity of demand coefficient becomes 0.45. If our price elasticity of demand coefficient is greater than 1, we can say that our product or service is elastic between the points in the curve used in the calculation. If it is equal to 1, then it is said to be unitary or unit elastic. If the price elasticity of demand coefficient is less than 1, then it is considered inelastic. Let's now compare the price elasticity of demand between A and B to the price elasticity of demand between points H and G on the same linear demand. Will it be the same or different? Here is the calculation, and we see that it is different. Why are these coefficients different? It is because we are calculating relative changes between price and quantity, not merely slope or opportunity cost. The price elasticity of supply is calculated as the percentage change in quantity divided by the percentage change in price. This calculation is performed just like the one shown for price elasticity of demand. The meaning of the size of the coefficient is the same as well. If the price elasticity of supply is greater than one, then it is considered elastic. If it is one, it is considered unit elastic. And if it is less than one, it is considered inelastic. <music> The horizontal lines show that an infinite quantity will be demanded or supplied at a specific price. This illustrates the cases of a perfectly or infinitely elastic demand curve and supply curve. The quantity supplied or demanded is extremely responsive to price changes. Moving from zero for prices close to P to infinite when prices reach P. One easy way to memorize the perfectly elastic curve is to associate it with the horizontal lines of the capital letter E for elastic. The vertical supply curve and vertical demand curve show that there will be zero percentage change in quantity supplied or demanded regardless of the price. This illustrates the case of zero elasticity or perfect inelasticity. The quantity supplied or demanded is not responsive to price changes. One easy way to memorize the perfectly inelastic curve is to associate it with the vertical line 
of the capital letter I for inelastic. A demand curve with constant unitary elasticity will be a curved line. Notice how price and quantity demanded change by an identical amount or constant percentage in each step down the demand curve. A constant unitary elasticity supply curve is a straight line reaching up from the origin. Between each point, the percentage increase in quantity supplied is the same as the percentage increase in price. Elasticity analysis can give us insight into the impact of forces like cost saving gains, or in other words, the introduction of new equipment or new production practices that decrease the cost of production for suppliers. Cost saving gains cause supply to shift to the right from SO to S1. That is, at any given price, firms will be willing to supply a greater quantity. If demand is inelastic, as in the graph on the left, the result of this cost-saving technological improvement will be substantially lower prices. If demand is elastic, as in the graph on the right, the result of the same cost-saving technological improvement will be only slightly lower prices. Consumers benefit in either case from a greater quantity at a lower price, but the benefit is greater when demand is inelastic as in the graph on the left. A higher cost, like a higher tax on cigarette companies for, from the example in the text, lead supply to shift to the left. This shift is identical in both of the graphs shown. However, in the graph on the left, where demand is inelastic, the cost increase can largely be passed along to consumers in the form of higher prices, without much of a decline in equilibrium quantity. In the graph on the right, demand is elastic, so the shift in supply results primarily in a lower equilibrium quantity and a small change in price. Consumers suffer in either case, but in the graph on the left, they suffer from paying a higher price for the same quantity, while in the graph on the right, they suffer from buying a lower quantity and presumably needing to shift their consumption elsewhere. Let's take a look at how elasticity determines if certain taxes, like an excise tax, will generate more or less tax revenues for the government. An excise tax introduces a wedge between the price paid by consumers, PC, and the price received by consumers, PP. When the demand is more elastic than supply, the tax incidence on consumers, PC minus PE, is lower than the tax incidence on producers, PE minus PP. As we see in the graph on the left, when the supply is more elastic than demand, the tax incidence on consumers, PC minus PE, is larger than the tax incidence on producers, PE minus PP. As seen on the graph on the right, the more elastic the demand and supply curves are, the lower the tax revenue. The next concept looks at the impact of timing on elasticity. In the short run, elasticity tends to be relatively inelastic. And in the long run, it tends to be relatively elastic. This makes sense because information about changes in the market and adjustments to those changes take time. Therefore, in the long run, with more time, more adjustments tend to take place, leading to a more elastic or responsive demand curve. These graphs provide us with a visual example for this. The intersection, EO, between demand curve D and supply curve SO is the same in both graphs. The, the shift of supply to the left from SO to S1 is identical in both graphs. The new equilibrium, E1, has a higher price and a lower quantity than the original equilibrium, EO, in graphs. However, the shape of the demand curve, D, is different in both graphs. In the graph on the left, demand is less elastic, and in the graph on the right, demand is more elastic. As a result, the shift in supply can result either in a new equilibrium with a much higher price 
and in only slightly smaller quantity, as in the graph on the left, or in a new equilibrium with only a small increase in price and a relatively larger reduction in quantity, as in the graph on the right. Income elasticity of demand tells us how much our demand for a given product or service changes as our income changes. Normally, we see the demand for a product or service go up if our income rises and go down if our income drops. The products and services that have income elasticity of demands that are positive numbers are these types of products and are called normal goods and services. Products and services that have negative income elasticity of demands are termed inferior goods and services. This is the equation for calculating the income elasticity of demand. It is important to remember that the equation is calculated fundamentally the same as other elasticity coefficients, except in this case we use income amounts in the denominator. Steak might be considered a normal good, and ramen noodles might be considered an inferior good, because as our incomes rise we may eat more steak and less ramen noodles, and as our income drops we may eat less steak and more ramen noodles. What if we wanted to know if two products or services were substitutes or complements? Do economists have a tool to determine this? The answer is yes. Cross price elasticity of demand is the tool economists use to determine the relationship between the price of one product and the quantity demanded of another. This is what the equation for cross price elasticity of demand looks like. It is important to remember that the equation is calculated fundamentally the same as other elasticity coefficients, except in this case we use the quantity of one product in the numerator and the price of another in the denominator. Substitute goods have positive cross price elasticities of demand. If good A is a substitute for good B, like coffee and tea, then a higher price for B will mean a greater quantity consumed of A. Complement goods have a negative cross price elasticity. If good A is a complement for good B, like milk and cookies, then a higher price for B will mean a lower quantity consumed of A. We can connect the concept of elasticity with the labor and financial markets that we discussed in chapter 4. We remember that the price of labor was the wage, and the quantity of labor was the amount of labor supplied by individuals. Now we can calculate the elasticity of labor supply by using this knowledge and this equation. This coefficient is calculated and interpreted in the same manner that price elasticity of supply and demand are. In the financial market, the price of money is the interest rate, and the quantity is the amount of dollars transacted in a financial market. Savings of households and individuals are the supply side of financial markets. We can calculate the elasticity of savings and the coefficient will give us insight into the supply of money based on the changes of interest rates. Here is the equation. This coefficient is also calculated and interpreted in the same manner that price elasticity of supply and demand are. The elasticity of the demand side for both labor and financial markets can also be calculated using these equations.